there's a dock right by the blue, right there, and Nathan and I sat there and right after golf by the golf course there. how low the water was. I used to go there a lot in the 90s. Yeah. Wow. I used to like Norland too. I don't know what that's. Because I lived in Ravenna as a kid. Come home from work, go to West Branch.
Good morning. Welcome to Brexel United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Heidi Welch, and whether you call Brexel UMC your spiritual home or this is your first time joining us, it is good to be worshiping together this morning. Brexel UMC strives to be an inclusive church, which means that we intentionally make space for everyone to encounter the unconditional love of God. It doesn't matter your age, your gender, your race, your income level, your sexual orientation or ability, you are welcome here. And you're invited and encouraged to participate in our ministries and our missions. And here at BUMC, our mission is to create safe spaces to grow with God and with one another. And this morning we have people who are worshiping here in person as well as people who are joining us online and I want to share a special welcome to those joining us online. Thank you for allowing us in to your worship space wherever that might be. The wonderful thing about online worship is that people can worship from anywhere in the world or in any time during the week. And so we would love to know where and when you're worshiping with us. So if you would uh, please fill out the online um, attendance form and the pew pad, if you will, electronic pew pad, then please do that and let us know where you're joining us from and give us any information so that we might send you a greeting back. And in person, we have our red um, pew pads that are in the pews on the inside aisle of the pews, and so you can pass those down, um, write your name, mark your attendance, and it's a great way to get to know the people who are sitting with you in worship. It's a great way to get to know names, introduce, introduce yourself, update any information that you might have and to give us so that we can then stay connected with you as well. Our bulletin for today's service has all of the information that you might need for today's service, as well as ways to get connected to here at BUMC. And I want to invite you, um, if you are worshiping online, we are going to celebrate Holy Communion together. And in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open table. So we invite you and we extend our table, Christ's table, all the way around the world and I invite you to gather together some bread and some juice so that you might celebrate with us wherever you are. It is wonderful that we are here this morning to worship God, to celebrate, to continue, and to finish up our series on the disciple Peter. And so with that, I invite you to join with me in this call and response call to worship. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus said, forgive 70 times seven. Jesus said, feed my sheep. In response, we say, here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let us worship God with all our hearts. I invite you to stand as we sing together, come thou fount.
be seated, and I'd like to welcome up Miss Jenny and the kids for our children's moment. Well, hello, how are you all doing today? You good? Good. I have a big question for you. I want you to think about, have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever made a mistake? Have you guys ever made a mistake? Yeah? Ha has anybody here ever made a mistake? Okay. So, <laughs> what do you, do? okay, so, there's one person who hasn't, I don't know, I'm not sure, but, but for the most part, we've all made mistakes, right? So here's my next question, and this is a big one. What do you do after you make a mistake? Do you just give up? Or do you try again? Theo? Try again. You try again, right? Okay, we're gonna switch gears, and I have a game questions for you. These things in my bag are all they all have something in common. Here is a safety pin. <gasps> Bubble wrap. Potato chips. Chocolate chip cookie. Uh, this is really good Velcro. I could not believe how challenging it is to to pull this Velcro apart, but it's Velcro. Velcro. Post-it notes. Coca-Cola. Trademark. No. Super glue. And silly putty. What do all these things have in common? They're objects. They are all objects, that's true. Hannah? Uh, they were all made by humans. They were all invented by humans. Gabriel? They all make a sound. They all make a sound. Kind of, yeah, you're right. They do all make a sound, but there's something bigger about them all. God something? No, not, thank you, Brandon. That is always the answer. No, not God something. They were all made by mistake. All of these things were made by mistake. Each and every one of them, the inventor was either, I love the safety pin one, and I hope he benefited from it, but he was sitting at his desk with so many bills piled up and he didn't know how he was going to pay for them and he was playing with wire and he was nervous and he ended up making a loop and figuring out, oh my goodness, this could be used like a pen, and hopefully did well with that. But yeah, all of these things were made by mistake. Whoever was working on something different, the story behind potato chips is quite funny, and there's two different versions of it. One, um, a man sent out uh, french fries at a restaurant in, I think it was in New York, and the, the customer was like, these are too mushy, I don't like them. And so he thought he would prove a point and he cooked them to the point of like being crisps and the, the customer was like, these are fantastic because he cut them so thin and he cooked them until they were crispy. Um, so they were made by mistake. The person who was making something different, who made a mistake along the way, invented something that we love and use all the time and enjoy eating like chocolate chip cookies. Those were supposed to have chocolate swirled through them. She thought that the chocolate would melt more. So it's kind of an interesting thing, and it's something I want you to think about. Even when our mistake ends up maybe hurting somebody else's feelings or hurting another person, we can turn that around and we can make it good. We don't have to give up on those relationships, those friendships, when we make a mistake and we hurt somebody. When we mess up with something we were trying to do, it's important for us to take a step back and look at it again and wonder, is there something good in here? 
And so I want you to, um, Pastor Heidi, would you come and I, what I want you to do is you each get a, a silly putty to take home. Before we go up to Sprouts, I'd like you to drop it off at the pew with your parents, just so we don't lose it upstairs, but please drop it off. And I, when you hold this silly putty and you hold it in your hand, what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to think about maybe something that maybe is a mistake that you made and something that you want to go to God with and something that you can figure out a way to make it right. And know this above all things as you're holding your silly putty. No matter how many mistakes you make, God always loves you through them. Let's take a minute to pray. Good and gracious God, we are a people who do make mistakes. Sometimes our mistakes are just about things, but sometimes our mistakes are with people. And God, we just ask you that you open up our hearts and our minds to figure out ways to make it right. To figure out ways to apologize to somebody that we've hurt or to really, really let them know how much we love them. And God, as we play with our silly putty, help us to really have this in our mind. And to remember that no matter what, no matter what kind of day we've had, no matter what, you love us through it. Amen. All right. Preschool kindergarten, guys, you are going to go up with Ms. Taylor and Ms. Lily, and you are going to learn about um, the road to Emmaus. And the rest of you are going to come up with me, and we are going to start our Thomas class. God who shows up in our lives surprising and catching us off guard in the best of ways. We believe in a God who cares for God's people, a shepherd who longs for her sheep to be fed and tended. And we believe that God uses ordinary people to do good in the world. Therefore, we believe and hope that God can use us, you and me too. When you give to Brexville UMC, God gives everything you give to help ordinary people overcome the world's hate with God's love, not only here in Brexel, but around the world. I invite you to be a part of the, that work that we, may, that we have many ways to give in person. The welcome team will pass the offering plates through the pews. Those who can give online can place one of the electric giving cards into the plate, which are available in the pew in front of you. For those joining online, you are encouraged to give through our secure website or via text. Now I invite the welcome team to come forward as we gather our tithes and offerings and do incredible work with God.
Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing upon these offerings so that they may be used in service to your people by creating communities built on hope. And may you bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we really can make a difference so that through your grace, we are able to do what others can claim cannot be done. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. The story of Jesus appearing to his disciples on the beach. Hear these words of scripture. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped out his outer garment around him for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Here's My Heart, a poem by Reverend Sarah A. Speed, inspired by The Lanyard by Billy Collins. As a child, I made a nativity set for my mother. Pinch pot clay, uneven angel wings, hair made with the help of a garlic press. Joseph's staff rolled out like I was God and it was an earthworm. There was nothing beautiful about it, nothing whispering of talent, but I made it for my mother. So I wrapped that questionable piece of art in a box and gave it to her like I was handing her a Picasso. 
Here, mother, you carried me in your womb. You bandaged my knees when I fell. You made soup when I was sick. You rocked me to sleep as an infant and sewed my costumes by hand. In return, I made you this haphazard nativity. And in my childlike mind, I thought that the small white lamb molded from a lumpy piece of clay could somehow make us even, could somehow balance the scales, could somehow pay her back and bless my mother because in her grace, she smiled and she displayed that hodgepodge nativity set on the mantle as if it were her pride and joy. I believed that it was. Maybe that's the way it is with God. I say, here's my heart, and God smiles, and God takes it. And despite the ragtag nature of my human-hearted faith, whatever I can give always ends up on God's mantle. Whatever I can give always calls for pride and joy. Throughout Lent, we have learned about our own faith journeys as we've learned from the life and the faith of the disciple Peter. And we've watched as Peter has dropped his nets to follow Jesus, as he's trusted Jesus enough to step out of the boat and walk on water towards Jesus, as he has professed his faith declaring that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And then, just after, was rebuked by Jesus for not understanding or trusting God's plan fully. And then, as, as Peter was humbled, having his feet washed by Jesus, and then denying Jesus three times. And finally, last week, Jesus running to the tomb when the women shared that Jesus was alive. And so now, today, we come full circle with Peter as he meets Jesus once more on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, fishing with his friends, just like when Jesus first called him into ministry. And in Peter, we are shown that faithfulness is not this straight line that we think it is, but it can seem like a wandering path with hills and valleys, detours, and even some roundabouts. The important thing is that somehow we remain tethered to God, even if it's by a thread, because even when we lose sight with God, God never loses sight with us. Let's pray. God of second chances, God of new life, We have spent our days wandering. Like Peter, we have milled about through nearly every state of faith. We've had courageous days and convicted days, learning days and questioning days. We've had days where we run to you, days of diving out of the boat and for deep joy, and days where the pain of the world feels too close to bear. So today, We bring our wandering hearts to you, and we ask that you draw us in. Allow this story to spark something new within us. Allow this story of grace to give us pause and to pull us in, for we are listening, O God. Amen. Not all those who wander are lost. This is a famous quote from the epic fantasy series, The Lord of the Rings. And in the story, this statement is used to describe Aragon, who from the perspective of the world, looks like he's wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. But truthfully, what's really happening with Aragon is that his character is being strengthened and he's being molded for greatness. And we can experience a similar thing when we wander throughout our faith journey. Several weeks ago, I shared about a time in my own faith journey when I fell away from the church and from God. 
I was in college, I was taking a, a Christianity course, and I, I just could not make sense of how or why people who followed a loving, grace-filled God would wage wars and crusades in God's name. It did not make sense. And I didn't understand why God would allow it to happen. I felt betrayed and hurt by God and by the religious tradition that I loved so very much. And so I set out to search for other religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, to see what I could learn from them, to see if there were any better religions out there. I was completing a religious studies degree at, the Young, at Youngstown State, and so I was in a place where I could take these classes and I could learn from people who ascribed to these religions, to deep dive into their beliefs, their history, their culture, and their traditions. And I found things as I was searching that really resonated with me and helped me to think about the things that we do and believe as Christians in a deeper and a more meaningful way. And as I searched those other religions, I also, I found God, the God that I knew and I loved through Jesus. I found stories that were about other people, about other places in the world, stories that have a value all on their own, and yet in those stories, God met me. I read a story from the Islamic faith and I was reminded of Jesus. I learned about Buddha, and I saw Jesus. But I was convinced in that time that God was mad at me for wandering, for doubting, for, for me being mad at God. God was mad back. And it took some serious conversations in those moments to, with my pastors to help me to see that God wasn't actually mad at me. That was my own guilt coming back in that God understood my hurt. God understood that I was struggling, and God was waiting patiently for me to return back to God. Actually, what I thought was wandering, was running away from God, was actually exploration with God, because God had never left me. God was, in fact, walking alongside me the entire time, loving me and showing me God's goodness, even in those moments when I felt like I had been pulled away and pulled myself away from God. And I can imagine that Peter is feeling that, that same type of feeling in today's scripture. Because the night before Jesus' arrest, Peter had told Jesus, he promised Jesus, I will never deny you right? That's what he says. And yet, when he's confronted with that opportunity, Peter did just that. He denies Jesus three separate times. And even though Peter knew that Jesus was alive, he had been there twice when Jesus appeared to the disciples. And Jesus had said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. But I can imagine that in that moment, knowing what Peter had gone through and experienced, that Peter is thinking, well, surely that's for everyone else, and that Jesus doesn't include me in that. Previously, Jesus had named Peter, had renamed him. When Jesus first met him, his name was Simon. Then Peter professes his faith for Jesus. He declares, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And so Jesus replies, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And Jesus goes on and says, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, Peter, meaning rock, on this rock, on you, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus has renamed 
this man, had said, I'm going to build my church on you. But a lot had happened since then. Peter had denied Jesus after promising him, no, I will never do that. And surely Jesus was furious and let down by Peter in that moment call, and, and had given up on the calling in his life, that the calling in, in Peter's life had been voided by his, his doubt and his denial. But then in today's scripture, we see that Jesus comes to this small group of disciples and he creates this, this quiet moment in the early morning next to the Sea of Galilee. Sitting by the fire, he asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus says, Simon, son of John, Simon, son of Jonah, using Peter's original name as if to say, do you still want to be the rock? The rock on which I build my church? Do you want that calling? Do you want that name? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says then, feed my sheep. And I can imagine that it's, it's quiet. Jesus says this, and then it gets quiet, and that it's that early morning quiet when you're sitting around a fire. Do you know that quiet? Right? Nope, nobody's ever done it. Yes, you know this quiet. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You know that quiet, and you're sitting there, and you're staring at the fire, and it's crackling, right? And the wood is popping, and you're just staring at the flames. And then Jesus says, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. And then almost immediately, Jesus asks him one more time to count out those three denials, the three times, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, it says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him that third time, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Peter was hurt because, not necessarily because of what Jesus was doing, but because of that guilt and that grief that he was feeling of denying Jesus and that was still raw inside of him. And he wanted so desperately for Jesus to know that he was sorry, that he knew he had messed up, and that now more than ever, Peter loved Jesus. And Jesus shows that he fully understands completely everything that Peter is experiencing. And he responds, feed my sheep. And he continues, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And then Jesus said, follow me. Jesus knew that through Peter's wandering, he had matured in his faith. Peter knew now on a deeper level than he could ever imagine before what it meant to be a disciple and to follow Jesus. He had been put in that place to deny him. He'd experienced that, and he knew what he should have done now. And he was going to need that deeper, mature faith to really truly be the rock on which Jesus was going to build his church. And so in this moment, we see Jesus renewing Peter's calling, that calling that he was first given to go and fish for people. Now he extends the calling to say, okay, you're not just going to fish for people and bring them. You're going to care for them, and you're going to love them. You're going to feed my sheep. Not just getting them, but care for them like a shepherd. Love them like I would love them, Jesus is saying. And it's that call back to right before Jesus died, that night before Jesus died, he says to his disciples, just as I have loved you, you also love one another. 
By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus is reminding Peter to keep that commandment, that that is how he is going to show his true love for Jesus, to put his love into practice, feeding and tending Jesus' sheep. I'm sure that when Peter woke up that morning, he was wondering where his place was. He was struggling with his place in Jesus' life, in ministry, what he was going to do next. He was fishing, like before Jesus found him, because he didn't know, after all of that denial and that doubt, where his place was in life. And so Jesus meets him in that vulnerable moment, knowing Peter's true heart, affirming, I knew you were going to wander, and I was with you the whole way. This is how we feel sometimes in our faith journeys, when, especially when we doubt. We feel bad, we feel that guilt for questioning and wondering. We should just be confident in our faith, right? We should just know these things, and that should be it. That's what we're told. But then we wonder and we grow up. We learn things about the world. We learn things about people who call themselves Christians. And we doubt and we struggle and we feel guilty. And here in this story, we are reminded that Jesus meets us there, looks past all of that doubt, and knows that we are stronger when we come to Jesus again. I was convinced that God was mad at me for all of my wandering and questioning and, and discovering new religions. I, I thought there was, I had felt a call to ministry before that doubt, and I was convinced that I had just thrown away the calling, that it didn't count anymore, right? But through my wandering, through all of that exploration, I came to have this greater confidence that that living as Christ would, that following Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ, is the way that I can best be connected to God, the way that I find wholeness through the divine, and the way that I can show God's love to others. And so in many ways, my wandering equipped me to be a better pastor, especially in this post-Christian world we find ourselves in. In Peter, we are shown, we are reminded that faithfulness is not a straight line. There are always those hills and valleys, the detours, the roundabouts, the exit ramps, the on-ramps, whatever kind of analogy you want to use. But the important thing is that somehow we remain tethered to God, even if it's by that little tiny thread Because when we lose sight of God, even then, God is always watching and always wandering with us. So when we see God, when we are like Peter and we're on that beach, we see we're in the boat, Jesus is on the beach. And I love the part of the scripture where it says, okay, I had to read it because it's one of my favorites. It says, The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. So they're standing on the boat, and he says, it's the Lord. And Peter's like, it's the Lord. And he jumps out of the boat, and he runs. All the other logical disciples are like, we're 100 feet. We're going to (laughs) row. But but Peter jumps out of the boat, and he's like, I can't wait for that. I'm going. And he runs towards Jesus. And when we do that, God is waiting there, just as Jesus was on the beach with open arms and food for our hungry souls and bellies. And that's what happens when we come to this table. We might saunter up the aisle. We might reluctantly wander, or we might race. And however we come, Christ meets us here, feeding us and our souls and our hearts, and our stomachs. 
Each time we come to this table, we pray a prayer of confession together, acknowledging, recognizing that we are like Peter, that Peter was faithful and messy, humble and afraid, loving and cautious, and just like him, even despite our faith, we make mistakes. And despite our belief, we carry that unbelief. Despite our love, we can cause harm. So like Peter, let us return to God with this prayer, confessing the truth of our lives, knowing that God's grace does not end, but God's grace reaches all the way to us. So let us pray this prayer of confession together. Gracious God, like Peter, we crawl out of the boat only to sink. You tell us your truth and we push it away. We ask about forgiveness and are surprised by abundance. We profess our faith and deny it three times. We run to the empty tomb and leave in silence. Over and over again, we find ourselves wandering along the journey of faith. Tether us to your heart. Forgive our surprise, our denial, and our limited imagination. Call us out of the boat once more. We are eager to return to you. With humble hearts, we pray. Amen. The first time that Peter saw Jesus after his crucifixion, Jesus asked him those three times, do you love me? And it was not because Jesus doubted Peter's response, but that repetition was because Jesus was offering Peter grace, overcoming his doubt with his grace. Friends, the grace of our God knows no end. When we stumble, when we fall, when we deny God or cause harm, Jesus meets us where we are and offers us a second chance. So let us rest in this good news. Does God love you? Yes. 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 God loves you. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God for a love that never ends. In that morning meal with the disciples, we are reminded of God's abundance and love and God's care for us. And the same is with this meal. When we come, we are reminded that when we come to God, whether it's running or sauntering or wandering or, I don't know, skipping, God is here and God meets us with open arms and love. O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. On these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, O oh God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we get to feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open table, which means that all are welcome to come and to receive God's grace and forgiveness if you are willing to come. It is a gluten-free table and an alcohol-free table and an attempt to break down any barriers that we possibly can. Those joining us online, you are welcome to participate with us. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And here in person, the welcome team will guide you forward. And if you would like for us to bring elements to you, just let us know, let one of the welcome team members know, and we are happy to bring, extend the table to you. Let us come and let us remember 
2,000 years later, we come to this table. We remember that Jesus said, I have a seat saved for you, for each and every one of us. So let us come hungry and let us come seeking. And let us come with our wandering hearts and our fickle faiths and know that Christ has a seat for us. Thanks be to God. Let us celebrate together.
Let us pray. Gracious and glorious God, we thank you for this mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Oh God, we know that you join us in our journeys. You feed our souls with your presence and your grace. May you send us out nourished, accompanied by your spirit to love your people, to bear one another's burdens, and to proclaim your kingdom here in this world, a kingdom of love, of hope, of joy, and of true peace. We pray these things through the power and the presence of your spirit. Amen. And now, as Michaela and Sean share some special music with us, I invite those who are joining us online to share any prayers on Facebook at, or at prayer at brexelumc.com or on our text number.
Thank you, Michaela and Sean. We have a few prayers that have come in. Sue asked for prayers for her 32-year-old niece, Kelsey, who is undergoing testing for heart issues. And prayers for Aaron, uh, healing from a collapsed lung. Prayers of healing for Antonio's dental surgery, as well as for Ruth, who has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Amelia asked for prayers for her grandpa. And Taylor asked for continued prayers for Sharon and for a healthy pregnancy for her and her baby. And Kim said prayers of joy and thank God for God's protection and healing this week um, as she took a spill on the stairs and is doing well and doesn't have a neck brace on or anything. And with that, let us go to our Lord in prayer. O oh God of second chances and God of grace, we know that you meet us here. Just as you met your disciples on the beach, you walk toward us and you gather us together. O oh God, just like Peter, we have known storms in our lives. This week, those among us have grieved, have felt overwhelmed by the news cycle and helpless to make a difference. This week, those among us have felt lonely and stressed and uncertain. You know what our wind and our waves look like. You know the nature of our storms. And just as you walk toward Peter, O oh God, we know that you walk toward us. And fortunately, like Peter, we have seen you stop the storms. We've seen your fingerprints in the lives in the ways we will not always expect. And with gratitude in our hearts, we come and we say thank you. Thank you for this church family that feels like a home. For these stars and the sky that remind us of your vastness. For your stories of hope and forgiveness that inspire us to love. Thank you for the unending grace that encircles our wandering hearts. Oh God, we pray that you will never stop meeting us. You will never stop gathering us in and leading us closer to you. And so with wandering and grateful hearts, we pray, just as your son taught us to pray so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The last thing we do each and every Sunday is to remind ourselves that what we talk about here, what we feel here, the love and the connection and the community goes with us into the world so that we might care for people in God's kingdom. And so I invite you, there are a few ways that you can do that this week. The first is that tomorrow is the solar eclipse, and I'm sure many of you have plans and are excited. I know my kids are like beside themselves, as am I a little bit. Um, but if you have glasses that you are going to use for, I don't know, what, half hour, maybe tomorrow? And then they're not going to be needed anymore. And so we will take them and we will recycle them so that others can use them around the world at later times so that they're not going into our landfill. So you can drop them off here um, at the church next week um, throughout the next couple of weeks um, and we'll put them to good use. And then also we have our um, fundraiser, our annual fundraiser for the hanging baskets uh, to support youth missions. You can purchase a voucher and then go to Coleman's Greenhouse and, and pick out your baskets so you get exactly what you want. They're fantastic and the money goes towards youth missions for this summer. And then Saturday, April 13th, is uh, that's next Saturday, is we have opportunities to serve here at the church and into the community. The first is with the uh, 
bike fix it. You can come from nine to noon in our fellowship hall and you can um, fix up bikes so that they can go to people in the community who need them and all throughout Cleveland who need them. Or you can also meet here on Saturday morning and then we will go to Trials for Hope. And this is a place that, that provides and cares for people who are unhomed in the Cleveland area. And then also our donation drive for April. We have like a million and one ways to be in ministry and in mission together. Um, our April donation drive is for large plastic reusable shopping bags. The ones that you get at like Marks or TJ Maxx or I don't, everywhere. Um, you can pick those up and you can drop those off here at the church or you can send them, um, mail them in, and those go um, for Trials for Hope, for di Dignity Kits, for the unhomed people. And then next Sunday, we begin a new worship series, and with that, we begin new studies on Sunday morning and then throughout the week. Um, I will have a new Bible study that begins on Wednesday nights. Sorry, Melanie, it was my fault. Uh, for the slides. On, online Bible study, you can join us for an hour, maybe an hour and a half if we get really, really excited, but we're going to go through first and second Peter. So we just had this whole series on Peter, and then Peter goes through the book of Acts and the new beginnings of the church, and we have two letters from Peter that Peter wrote, and so we're going to be studying those for the next six weeks or so. And so you can join us for that on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock via Zoom, and then next Sunday we begin all of our new worship series, or our worship series, and then our new studies. One, Dana is doing a, um, a poetry study, the poetry of Mary Oliver, that goes with each Sunday. Um, and so just like we've been having our poetry throughout the, these new these series with Sanctified Art, she has chosen some Mary Oliver poems, and you can come together and discuss those. And then also the podcast class returns, and they are going to be meeting in um, the parlor, and so you can grab your coffee and you can sit down and you can just have some conversation about the podcast. Um, even if you haven't listened to it yet, you can listen to it later and just have some great conversation about that. And then um, also we will have a, we'll have basic beliefs. Um, that is something that I am doing that um, is if you want to know more about the United Methodist Church, if you have some burning questions about what we believe or what um, our theology is, what the history of the church is, different things like that. You can come and you can learn with me on that. It's a lot of fun for people who are newer to the church, as well as people who have been around a long time, and you probably don't know the things. Chuck. <laughs> I don't know, you're just sitting right in front of me. And then finally, we have um, on the 21st, we have a town hall meeting with our leadership board. It's following the 1030 service. Um, and we'll just gather together and talk a little bit about what leadership board is doing and answer any questions that you have. <sighs> okay, Whew, we did it. <laughs> with all of that, let us receive our benediction and go and do God's good work. Beloved wanderer, as you leave this time together, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face that you meet. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. You are called you are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you always belong to God. So go believing and knowing that good news, and go now in peace and not in pieces. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Have a great week.